And now to Nigeria, where a London-based NGO is mobilizing a media campaign against the country's first local oil refinery. And that's according to investigative journalist David Humdane. He said that the NGO, Dialogue Earth, tried to bribe him to write an article discrediting the facility. Now, let's now cross live to that journalist, David Hundane. David, it's good to have you join me now. An NGO called Dialogue Earth offered you 500 U.S. dollars to write a smear piece against the, the Dangote refinery. C can you tell us more about this? Um, so um, it's it's not uncommon for for uh, uh, a journalist like myself uh, in, the, in the international space to be contacted by different actors um, uh, uh, wanting to commission a piece for one reason or the other. Um, the reason this one took my attention was that this was coming off the backdrop of a very high profile series of news incidents regarding the Dangote refinery. And this NGO that reached out, um, in the, the way they reached out to me kind of made it implicit that they didn't, they didn't really want this to become public, that they're reaching out to me, but that, um, am I open to doing something? And it just struck me as a weird way of contact, of, of trying to commission a piece that am I open to this? Because if you're not doing anything shady, you would simply just come and say, Hey, I'm so and so from this organization. We want to commission a piece for blah, blah, blah. Are you available? Right. So I said, yeah, sure, I'm open. Send send the brief. And they sent the brief. And I instantly understood why um, the manner of reaching out to me was so shady, because um, the screenshots from the brief, which I'm sure you've, you've shared with the audience, which I, I shared earlier this morning, show very clearly that um, the purpose of this brief was essentially to write a smear piece against what, to all intents and purposes, is going to be a very important piece of um, economic infrastructure, not just for Nigeria, but for the entire West African coast. Bear in mind that this is a group of about 15 countries which have very little local refining capacity and are almost entirely dependent for their local fuel needs on uh, the outputs of European refiners. And as a result of that dependence, um, as I'm sure you remember from the famous Trafigura incident in 2006 in Cote d'Ivoire, European refiners have for a long time been able to get away literally with murder. They've been able to blend toxic waste. They've been able to blend extremely high sulfur fuel content into these cargoes um, headed for West Africa because, you know, who's going to do anything? It's just, it's just Africa, right? This is a refinery that is, that is not only going to change that dynamic by making West Africa less import dependent, but that potentially is also going to disrupt the European uh, uh, refining industry because I don't know if you're aware, the Dangote refinery is by far the biggest refinery in that, you know, that region of the world, the, the Europe, Europe, Middle East and Africa region. It's, all, it's more than double the size of the next biggest one. So clearly some people are not going to be happy about that. And it was clear that the purpose of this brief was to use the language of environmental concerns, to use the language of the sort of activism industry to, um, to attack the refinery and to lay the sort of narrative groundwork for the very validity or the very econ um, um, economic necessity of this refinery in a governance sense to be questioned, right? That by putting my name on this piece, obviously being that I have quite a high profile in Nigeria, and that by putting my name on this piece, I'm essentially going to be endorsing a, you know, a sort of astroturfed narrative that could potentially be used to attack the very existence of this refinery. Bear in mind that something like things like this have happened in Nigeria before. Um, to, for those who may not be aware, Nigeria has or had at one time the world's largest steel mill. Um, it's almost impossible to industrialize without producing steel, right? So the idea behind the steel mill, which was built, I think, in, in 1979 by Soviet contractors in a place called Aj uh, uh, Ajaokuta in Kogi State in Nigeria, was to give Nigeria local steel processing capacity. And because of chicanery like this, because of things that came out of people's pens, and because of memos that came out of offices, to date, that, uh, that steel mill has not worked. To date, there was nothing wrong with the steel mill, technically. Um, it, I think it had achieved something like 98% uh, completion before the contractor stopped work. There was actually, there's actually nothing wrong with it. It was purely political 
the reason why that stalemate didn't get to work. And I could see that something similar potentially is being set up with this refinery here. This is a refinery that putting aside whatever concerns that I personally have had about the business practices of the individual or the company behind it, objectively speaking, this is a very important piece of national economic infrastructure. Nigeria is, like many other African countries, suffers from that basic African economic problem of exporting raw materials cheaply and importing expensive finished goods, such that your currency is constantly depreciating because you constantly have a balance of payments and balance of trade deficits constantly by design. This refinery is a, 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 a piece of economic infrastructure that promises to reverse that trend. Bearing in mind that Nigeria's largest single foreign um, expense is import of fuel, right? So it makes sense for, Dan for Dangote refinery from a Nigerian economic point of view to work. So why on earth is this British NGO then trying to commission a prominent Nigerian voice, a local Nigerian voice to sort of set up a campaign of, of sort of um, high level whispers against this refinery. You're talking about how, you know, if you if you read through the brief, um, it wasn't left to my discretion to determine how to even write the story. It was sort of laid out in very clear detail. This is how we want you to do this. This is how we want this to be framed. This is who we want you to speak to. This is how we want this to be worded. So essentially, they've basically given me the entire outline of the article, right? And I'm just to sort of flesh it out and put my name on it. So anyone who reads it then thinks that this is David Hundane's high level um, analysis of the situation. Meanwhile, this is something that came out of some desk in London. So I wanted to know who is actually behind this, and I started doing some digging. And it turns out that Dialogue Earth has received funding from the who's who of um, the, um, what I refer to as the, the American CSO NGO industrial complex. So the likes of Climate Works, which by the way has been banned in India for um, acting against the Indian national interest. The likes of uh, the, the Ford Foundation, which as many of us may know, is essentially a US intelligence front, right? and many other organizations like that. These are the funding entities behind this um, NGO known as Dialogue Earth. So then it, doesn't, it didn't take much to then connect with dots that if entities linked to wealthy Americans and to the American states are funding this institution, which is trying to fund me. And by the way, I don't know who else it has funded to push this particular narrative. I, I can only speak for myself, but I'm gonna assume that I'm not the only one. So if you draw the line up and there are American states and private institutions which are trying to create a narrative uh, war against this, uh, the only, what, what to all intents and purposes is the only functioning refinery in a country of 200 million people on the west coast of Africa, then what really is the goal here? And that's why I put out the, the sort of the tweet that I did earlier this morning, just sort of informing people that this is what is happening, right? They are, they are rich Europeans and Americans who, who um, we have long sort of suspected or known colloquially have some kind of an interest in preserving the African economic status quo. But here we have hard evidence that these people are actively um, uh, paying for a campaign to essentially keep Africa poor. All right. Uh, are they, you, you've given us a perspective to all of this now. Are there more examples about, as you wrote, a resistance campaign against Nigeria's first private local refinery? Well, um, so as I said, I, I, I would assume that I'm, I'm not the only one who was, who was reached out to by this specific NGO. But even zooming out for a second, even the... Um, the difficulty that the, that the refinery is facing in, in, in its, uh, its sort of opening stages of activity also points to some sort of high level gang up to prevent this thing from working both locally and internationally. Um, so though there was a, there was, there was a very interesting graphic that I saw on, on a Bloomberg article a few weeks ago that sort of outlined the, the sheer, difference in size between the Dangote refinery and, and the next biggest one, I think it's in Rotterdam. I think it's owned by Shell, right? And the Dangote refinery is almost double the size of the next biggest one in the region. And the trouble with this from a European perspective is that regardless of where the inputs to this Dangote refinery come from, 
it can export to pretty much anywhere and everywhere. And by virtue of its sheer size and scale, and its relative um, newness, because it's much newer than all these other ones, so it's also more efficient because the technologies are, are more up to date, that means that it's going to be more competitive and it's going to be able to offer traders um, refined fuels at a marginally lower rates. And if you're familiar with how all trading works, those tiny little margins make all of the difference. So essentially, this Nigerian refinery has been recognized um, as something that is potentially going to upend an entire European industry. And the European refiners clearly are not happy about this. There was an OPEC report which emerged yesterday, which you also may have seen, where it was stated very clearly that not only is it is it is Dangot refinery projected to potentially upend the European market, that it has already started upending the European market, that as far back as January this year, when it started um, uh, uh, exporting cargoes of like gas oil and jet fuel, that sort of thing, that these have gone almost exclusively to Europe. And basically, it's the local refiners in Europe who have lost out. So clearly, um, there is at least circumstantial evidence to point to the idea that based on the fact that some people's economic interests in Europe are clearly being hurt by the existence and the success of this Nigerian refinery, then some sort of counteracting measures have to be taken. And we have started seeing those counteracting measures. We've seen the sort of campaign of whispers um, from, from the end of people like myself, where you know they've reached out to a journalist. I'm going to assume there are many more. On the local front in Nigeria, we've seen all of a sudden the drama surrounding crude oil supply to Dangote Refinery, where all of a sudden um, the, the, um, the authorities in Nigeria, who, as you may or may not know, are very, very much U.S. aligned, and some, have, some will go as far as to describe them as a U.S. puppet administration, all of a sudden have made this huge song and dance about you know whether it's possible to actually supply Dangote refinery with feedstock or not. Bear in mind that Nigeria is Africa's largest oil producer. At, at one point, I think it was the world's eighth largest oil producer. And somehow, with a daily stated official daily production uh, of anything from 1.1 .1 to 1.8 million barrels per day, somehow cannot supply 650,000 barrels per day feedstock required by this refinery to function, right? And instead, we've, uh, we've, in fact, we've had um, re the, the local regulators come out and make very incendiary comments directly attacking the refinery. We've seen uh, the, the head of, 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 of a local regulator in Nigeria come out a few weeks ago and make comments, public comments, in front of you know, TV cameras and microphones to the effect of uh, the sulfur content in the diesel put out by, that, by Dangote Refinery is, is higher than regulatory limits, and that Dangote Refinery is trying to monopolize the country's energy sector, which whether that is true or not, it is incredible that a local regulator would come out and make such a comment about a local business, especially in a space where it's competing against, you know, very well-heeled, very old um, international oil companies. So that just shows the, the extent to which um, there are several entrenched interests, uh, both locally and internationally, which are aligned, which seem to um, uh, believe that it's not in their interest for this refinery to actually function. All right. Since you put out uh, this information, what was the, what has been the reaction from your colleagues or even the general public since now they are aware uh, how they approached you and and the details behind uh, what what you were originally commissioned to do? Well, so the reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, thankfully, um, a, a few of my colleagues in the media space have actually reached out um, to tell me that they're proud of me. Um, for actually turning this down. And they've um, made comments to the effect of um, similar offers, not necessarily from this particular NGO or for this particular purpose, but similar offers um, geared toward similar outcomes of essentially um, acting against Nigeria's economic interests, having made to them in the past or having made to people they know in the past. And it's not everyone that, um, that had this sort of um, big picture thinking to turn it down, um, because bear in mind that this is this the basic issue here is not necessarily about money or not money. The basic issue is that most people don't even understand that there are huge geopolitical interests and that there are, there's a huge geopolitical chess game 
going on in the world. Most people in these parts are sort of very focused on like their day-to-day -day career, the day-to-day -day survival, and any sort of opportunity to build some some pipeline of work or some credibility or some relationship with an international funding entity, they will jump on it, right? Without thinking about the potential uh, uh, ramifications of what it is that, do, that they're doing. So these colleagues have said that they're proud that at least I, I, I was able to see um, what was being done. Um, a, a few people I know within the NGO CSO space have also reached out um, to sort of nudge wink that well, yeah, we we know that these things happen, and we know that we we operate in the same space. And you know, we're not always we're not necessarily able to to be as bold and forthright as you are, because obviously you don't work in this space, and you know you don't you don't earn a living from this space. But we we respect the fact that you're doing it. We respect the fact that someone actually um, believes in the future of Africa enough to actually be able to not just turn it down, but to more importantly, to go public with it. Because what that the hope is that by going public, that when the Nigerian audience eventually sees this campaign sort of um, going to overdrive against the refinery, because I'm very sure that it's not gonna end with me. And as I said, I'm sure I wasn't the only one that was reached out to. But when Nigerians see um, more people coming up with these narratives, Nigerians will understand where this narrative is coming from, understand that it's not an organic narrative, understand that it's, it's a sponsored one, and it's a sponsored one from outside the continent. It's, it's a sponsored narrative by Western interests that categorically do not want Africa to, um, to change, really, that want Africa exactly where it is. All right. Thank you so much, David Hundeng, investigative journalist. Thank you for what you do, and thank you for your insight here. Thank you for having me.